Hello and welcome to Taming the Tiger, a simple path to releasing fear of cancer recurrence. If we haven't yet met, I'm Dr. Shani Fox. I help cancer survivors reclaim lives of wellness, authenticity, and joy. I'm a holistic physician as well as a certified life mastery coach, and my mission is that every cancer survivor receive loving expert care aimed at supporting complete recovery, building resilience to future disease, and leveraging the hard-won wisdom of the cancer experience to create a life of peace and deep fulfillment. Fear of cancer recurrence is a huge and largely unexplored topic. It's hard to find a safe place to discuss cancer-related fears, much less find solutions. Today, we're going to take a deeper look into why it's so important to find solutions for cancer-related fear, and you'll even have a chance to take a first step into a solution while we're on this broadcast. I'll give you everything I can today, and then if you'd like to dive more deeply into mastering a proven process for diffusing fear, I'll offer some next steps later in the broadcast. You may wonder what prompted my interest in this topic. My medical practice focuses on cancer survivors. I use natural means to help them recover fully after treatment and create resilient bodies that not only feel well, but are resistant to future disease. I quickly realized how many of my patients were struggling with fears around cancer. Many actually achieved beautiful physical recovery, but some would continue to speak and behave as if they weren't well. There were lots of reasons for this, but for some, there was actually a palpable sense of fear about their future, and they didn't know what to do about it. They can't heal or sustain optimal wellness in the presence of chronic fear. And so I made a commitment to find a way to help anyone who was struggling with that kind of fear so they could live full out with both the health and the sense of joy that they deserved. Let's define fear of recurrence for a moment. What, what are the symptoms of fear of recurrence? Well, it could be a sense of anxiety about a possible future event. In this case, it's cancer recurrence. In some cases, it even goes so far as to being a sense of doom or dread. It can be triggered. In fact, it's commonly triggered by unexplained symptoms. It's also in advance of the uh, follow-up testing appointments, it's also very common. If you have a scan coming up or lab work coming up, that often is enough to trigger the fear, often for several days in a row. And one more trigger might be the sights or the sounds that are reminiscent of a prior experience that was fearful or difficult for you, for example, chemotherapy. For some people, the fear is accompanied by physical symptoms. It results in muscle tension or insomnia, Sometimes it's things like irritability or lack of mental focus. And actually, that's deceptive, isn't it? Because there's actually intense focus going on, but it's around fear rather than on what's going on every day. Whatever the symptoms are, they can be pretty debilitating. They can actually degrade workplace performance and the harmony of relationships. They can get in the way of quality of life. For most survivors, the fear can come and go in episodes, but... In some survivors, it creates a hesitancy or even an unwillingness to commit to future plans, like starting new relationships or changing jobs. When that happens, it's not just an emotion anymore. It's become incorporated as a way of life. Now, something to remember is that this is very common. There are studies, actually, that indicate that up to 70%, 70% of survivors struggle with fear of cancer recurrence. If we think about why that might be, it's probably in part related to the magnitude of the challenge that cancer is. A diagnosis of cancer pulls the floor out from under us. All of a sudden, all the predictability of life, which made us feel safe, isn't there anymore. We can feel alone and overwhelmed. And then we proceed on to treatment, which is typically a challenge in its own right. 
our body, which we trusted to get us through each day without really thinking about it, is suddenly brought to the threshold of what it's able to handle. We no longer know how much we can trust our bodies. And then there's another point of fear, which many of my survivor patients tell me about, but it's the one that's least suspected for people who haven't been this through this experience. And that's the end. It's a very overlooked time, but what happens is the treatment ends and everybody celebrates and you get a cupcake and balloons and everybody says goodbye. And it doesn't take you as a survivor long to realize that all the structure and the support you had over the period of your treatment has just evaporated. You've been turned loose, typically without any go forward guidance at all. And you don't know who to talk to or what to do. Some of my patients describe that to me as the scariest point of all, being faced with an uncertain future and no one to guide you. It's important to understand that there are no emotional effects, such as fear, that don't also have physical effects. The emotions we feel, whether they're positive or they're negative, all produce biochemical changes within our bodies. The more consistent those emotions are, the more consistent the biochemical changes are and their resulting effects on our cells and our tissues. The emotion of fear triggers production of a soup of stress hormones, including cortisol and catecholamines. And, you know, the names aren't even that important. But the point is that our body is meant to produce these hormones in short bursts only in order to help our bodies respond in the presence of an actual physical threat. The way we evolved prehistorically, when we used to be in contact, for example, with wild animals, we might have had to run away suddenly. Our, the stress hormones get our body ready to do that. But they're meant to be produced for a very short time and then to subside. We're meant to live most of our life without high production of those hormones. The problem is that our bodies don't know the difference between the fear triggered in a moment of a real physical threat, like a wild animal chasing you, and a fear that's not triggered by a present threat, one that's really only in our imagination at the moment, that's a product of frightening thoughts about the future. And our bodies will pour out stress hormones in response to imagined threats, like worrying about cancer recurrence, just as they would if we were actually staring down a bear or a wild, other wild animal. So what we need to realize is that even if the fear exists only in our head, it's having constant physical effects and training our body to be accustomed to fear. Unfortunately, the chronic exposure to stress hormones has some pretty dangerous effects for us. Chronic exposure to stress hormones breaks down our body's resilience, in particular the resilience of our immune system. Our immune system loses some of its innate ability to fight off first-line threats. So what do I mean by this? We have cells that are called natural killer cells. And when we're faced by a threat, for example, a virus or any invader of our body, the natural killer cells go to work right away, right away. It's, they, they get mobilized within seconds and they go out to defuse that threat. The natural killer cells are also very useful in scour, scavenging and eating up any stray cancer cells that may be produced by our bodies. So as you probably know, most of us are producing some cancer cells every day, but if we have competent immune systems, our natural killer cells will go and find them and destroy them before they can ever get anchored in our body and produce a tumor. Constant stress, though, has the effect of impairing the function of our natural killer cells and other cells that defend us against such immediate threat. And so constant stress can actually reduce our ability to defend ourselves. And that's the last thing we want, of course, as cancer survivors. We want our immune system to be up and running at its optimal best as much of the time as we can. 
The other problem is that constant stress activates our stress physiology. In other words, the hormones that respond to stress so often that the system essentially wears out. It just gets tired and wears out. And after a while, we're not able to rouse that stress response when we need it. The result of that is something called a flattened cortisol curve. That's just an indication that our stress resilience has worn out. But the problem is that when that happens, we actually have research showing that in that condition, we become a lot less resilient to the occurrence of cancer. And so flattened cortisol curves, in other words, a worn out stress response system is associated with higher recurrence rates and, and lower survival rates. Again, the last thing we want for you. So we need to figure out what we can do to keep chronic stress from being a way of life with fear of cancer recurrence being one of the contributors to that chronic stress so that we can keep your immune system and your stress response system operating so that they protect you rather than predispose you to further disease. On the emotional end, constant fear is damaging as well. Fear is simply very disempowering. It creates the illusion that we're less powerful than we actually are. We feel helpless in the face of obstacles or circumstances that we don't feel we can overcome. And again, that's the last thing we want for you as a cancer survivor. You know, for most people, the experience of cancer treatment was already quite disempowering. From the moment of diagnosis, the typical experience is that you are shuttled right into a predetermined path of treatment, often without time to process what was happening. The treatment decisions were determined for you and your schedule was determined for you. Chances are you had very little input at all. And then at the other end, you came out into survivorship and everyone who previously pointed the way for you is no longer available. That typically generates a feeling of helplessness. And that in turn generates fear. And fear generates further helplessness. It's a vicious cycle that can be hard to break. And it can keep you from moving forward into the wellness and peace of mind that you deserve. So I consider treating fear on both the physical and the emotional levels to be part and parcel of a solid survivorship care plan in order to heal your body, in order to make you more resilient to cancer and other chronic diseases, and to give you every chance of happiness and success. So what do we do to help people, maybe including you, who have fear of recurrence? What do we do to help them heal? Well, in the long term, there are several solutions. And the first is re-empowerment. It's important that you feel like you're taking back your power and getting back in charge, both of your wellness and of your happiness. Any way in which I have personal power helps her remember that when fear arises, she has other choices than to allow it to occupy all her attention. I found that one really effective way to do this, to reconnect you with your power, is to help you create and adopt a sound cancer prevention plan. Creating a sound prevention plan involves becoming very self-aware, taking stock of your self-care practices. What are you doing to currently support your health? To be willing to learn how to fill in any gaps in your self-care. And of course, I help you discover what those are without any judgment and to fill those in, to find more effective practices to fill in those gaps or to help you elevate your self-care to the next level. You may be doing a great job on certain fundamentals, but you want to become more educated about it and more empowered around your self-care by learning, for example, what your personal risks are and learning how to work alongside those risks and create sustainable practices that fill in those gaps in your resilience. All of this can be very, very empowering. Just knowing that you're taking action doing what you can to discourage future disease and encourage vibrant wellness. It's a really life-giving process. 
So people who embrace self-care and prevention out of love for themselves tend to be a lot less fe fearful of cancer recurrence than anybody who sits around and plays the watch and wait game, which unfortunately is what's usually recommended by, to us by the conventional medical establishment. In the process of adopting sound self-care practices and prevention practices, what you're doing is you're reestablishing trust in your body. After cancer, it's easy to think that your body has betrayed you. I see it differently. Our bodies are actually marvels of evolution, and they have layers and layers of ways to keep themselves well. But modern life, which includes things like nutrient-poor diets, lack of physical exercise, often lack of sleep, lots of stress, all this is very hard on us, and it wears away our defenses, and sometimes we get ill. But here's the thing. Bodies don't lie. They're always telling us a truth, and when they express symptoms, what they're telling us is they need help, they need more support. When we actually listen to them and find out what it is, what the support is that they need and give that support to them, it's amazing how forgiving bodies are. If we align with our body's needs, it will, as best it can, recoup us and support us in being well into the future. It really wants to do that, and it's just waiting for us to understand the support it needs to get there. So what we find in the end is that we can actually trust our bodies to keep us well as long as we learn how to support them. And when we can trust our bodies, we have less thoughts about our body giving up on us again. Another long-term strategy to deflect fear is to get really interested in your own happiness. Some survivors come out of cancer treatment somehow feeling diminished, as if they have less hope for happiness than before. Now, it's true that life after cancer has some unique challenges, but truly there's nothing about it that makes a survivor less deserving of real happiness. You may have heard of Dr. Bernie Siegel. His first book was called Love, Medicine, and Miracles. And Bernie Siegel studied what he called exceptional survivors. These were people who lived a long, long time, much longer than the odds that were stated for them. In other words, they had prognoses that actually wouldn't have had them live very long, but they actually managed to way outlive their prognoses. And he got very interested in that. He, he was less interested in what makes people sick or keeps people sick and much more interested in what makes people well and keeps them that way. And what he found by interviewing many, many of them was that people who transform difficult situations and difficult odds are not those that deny their illness in any way. They understand what's going on. But what they deny is the power of those facts and circumstances to determine their future. They know they're ill, but they deny the fact of a diagnosis or a prognosis to deprive them of happiness. So their focus wasn't on the fact that they had a disease. They were focusing on what was possible after the disease. And not only that, they were doing it right then and there. They weren't waiting till some other time, till some future time, to do what made them happy. Writing the book or traveling or being with their families, whatever made their heart sing. They were doing it right then and there in the presence of a diagnosis or a prognosis. So their cells were getting messages of life, not of struggle and not of doom. And once you begin that journey, the journey towards your own happiness, the fear of recurrence, fear of any kind actually, it moves to the background because you're striving towards a freer and fuller expression of yourself. You're striving towards life, and that simply allows less room for fearful thoughts to arise or to stick around. 
And being a life mastery coach as well as a doctor, it's one of my great joys to help survivors through and beyond obstacles, even if they're imaginary obstacles, doesn't matter, but whatever obstacles exist to their happiness and in the process vastly reduce their fear. Now, those are possibilities for what to do in the long run in order to displace fear and replace it with your personal power, with your trust in your body, and with your own happiness, ultimately. But you may be asking right now, well, that's great, but what can I do today? I'm feeling kind of fearful today or next week when I have my scan. What do I do then? In that case, what you need is a short-term strategy. It's kind of like when you get a cut, you know, <laughs> the first thing you want is just a Band-Aid for it or to stop the bleeding. You know, later on, if it gets infected, you'll find some other way to, to help it. But you just want something to help you right away. So a short-term strategy, what do we do in the case of fear? Well, it's not as easy as just putting a Band-Aid on. I wish it was. But nevertheless, because I saw lots of people in this situation, I looked around for a simple and reliable way to help people diffuse fear within just a few moments. Actually, when I went out to look, I wasn't able to find that solution, so I created one. So let's look at what could be a short-term solution. As a short-term solution, I developed a special first aid kit. It's called the Cancer Survivor's Fear First Aid Kit. And it's a simple and easy to learn five step method for moving out of fear and recentering, anchoring into calm within moments. The basic idea behind the first aid kit is that while fear can't be eliminated absolutely and forever, it can be displaced. It's something like light and dark. If you think about it, light and dark can't occupy the same space. If you want to walk into a if you, if you, sorry, if you walk into a dark room and you want to light it up, you don't go fighting with the dark. You don't go find a stick to beat the dark with. You go find a way to create light. You plug in a lamp or light a candle or flip a switch or, or do whatever you need to do to produce light. And when you do, the dark goes away because it cannot occupy the same space as the light. So when we're fearful or anxious, our attention is occupied by thoughts of what could happen to us in the future. And the more anxious we are, the more we envision in our minds those frightening circumstances and the less attention we can pay to what's actually happening right now in the present. That's why people with fear of recurrence often feel mentally fuzzy. It's because your attention has been hijacked into an imagined future. There isn't even enough attention left to spare or barely for your job or your children or other concerns of today. It actually comes down to a question of your attention. There was once a young Native American boy who was ready for his vision quest. In his tribe, it was the custom to send young lads out into the forest to fend for themselves for a while, to develop their courage and they would come back that many steps closer to being men. As he approached the time of his vision quest, he found himself afraid. He knew there were wild animals in the forest, and he was simply afraid, thinking what could happen to him. He finally went to the chief of the tribe, and he said, I want to go on my vision quest, but it's as if there are two dogs fighting inside of me. One believes I'll succeed and one doesn't, and the one who doesn't is fierce and he's making me afraid. They keep on fighting and I don't know what to do. The chief put his hand on the young boy's shoulder and he said, the one who says you will succeed will win. And the boy asked, well, how do you know? And the chief said, that one is the one you will feed. That one will gain strength, and the other will starve. So 
So within us, that might be the voice of fear fighting with the voice telling us, you can do it. But how can you feed and amplify the voice that says you can? The way we do that is with our attention. Your attention is like nourishment. It amplifies and magnifies whatever thoughts you feed your attention to. And if you keep paying attention to fear, fear will get magnified and you'll feel more helpless. If you're able to move your attention to calmer, more empowered thoughts, you'll amplify satisfaction and gratitude and courage and happiness. Again, fear and calm are like light and dark. You can't focus on both at once. Your attention is on your, under your control. And so just like the exceptional survivors that Bernie Siegel studied, you can use your attention. You can learn to manage your attention and use it to displace fear. We can actually try this out right now. These are steps one and two of the five-step process. So let's take a pause here. And just notice your breath. Just pause. You don't have to do anything special. Just notice your breath going in and going out. Wherever your hands are, just let them rest. And if you haven't done it already, I invite you to close your eyes and just keep listening to the natural rhythm of your breath. Give yourself permission to do this. If this is new to you and you have trouble focusing on your breath, then you can count to three on the inhale and three on the exhale. One, two, three. One, two, three. Just feel the rhythm of your breath rolling in rolling out like calm waves at the shoreline. As you continue to follow your breath, just notice the sensations of where you are. Notice the feeling of your feet against whatever surface they're on. Notice whether your knees are bent or straight. There's no right answer. Just notice what is. Notice the sensation of your back and your legs against whatever surface they're on. Notice the sensation of the clothes against your skin. And keep on listening for the sound of your breathing. You may notice other sounds, and if you do, just let them float in and out of your attention. The important thing right now isn't the sound, but just the fact that you hear it. So once you've heard the sound and released it, 
return to the sound of your breath in and out. Listen in a little more closely and see if you can become aware of your heartbeat. Our heartbeat, our breath, are always there all the time. We rarely notice them, but they happen without any help from us whatsoever. Every moment of our lives, representing the great spirit of life that flows through us, that flows through you, always. As you notice the feedback of your sense of touch, of your hearing, your sense of sight, which you have even when your eyes are closed, as you take note of your breath and your heartbeat, notice how beautifully your body is working in this moment. Notice how alive your organs and your senses are. How alive you are. And feel gratitude for that aliveness, for how well your organs and your senses are working right in this moment. What's true in this moment is that life is pouring itself through you, operating your senses, operating your breathing, operating your organs, wanting to express itself through you. That life force flowing through you is greater than any fear. It's connected to the same life of this universe. And when you choose, that same kind and vibrant spirit can guide your life. So choose. Choose it. Choose to allow that life force to flow through you and guide you right now. Feel it within you. Feel it all around you like a warm hug. If you choose, you can give yourself a hug right now. Breathe in life's love for you. And holding that love within your heart, take one final delicious breath and slowly open your eyes and return to this space. So what was this exercise about? What I did was help you anchor yourself in three significant ways. Is become aware of your breathing. 
And when you become aware of your breath, you become very aware of where you are in the present moment. We rarely pay attention to the sound or the rhythm of our breath because it requires focused attention. Attention to the details of the input of our senses right in this moment. We're usually too busy occupied with other things to notice the input of our senses. I also had you activate your other senses. You noticed what you were touching or what was touching you and what you could hear, what you could see, even if only in your mind's eye. Noticing your sensory input requires acute attention to the present moment. What happens in those moments when you're noticing your breath and your senses is that you can't feel fear. You can't feel imagined fear. That's because fear isn't part of the present moment. When we're fearful, we're preoccupied with thoughts of the future. And you can't be both in the present and in the future at the same time. So when you pay full attention to the present moment, you are in a space where fear cannot interrupt you. And it's important to remember that life is actually the sum of a lot of present moments. The way we create our present moments is the way we create our life. Our present moments determine the quality of our days, which add up to the quality of our weeks and years. So the better you can anchor yourself in the present moment, the more likely you are to be able to anchor yourself in a place where fear cannot interrupt you. Second, calm and positive emotional tone or vibration. I sprinkled gratitude into that meditation. You know, if you picture an emotional spectrum. At one end of that spectrum, we have what I call the low vibration emotions, anger and jealousy and frustration. And if you go up to the other end of the spectrum, we have the high vibration emotions, joy, fulfillment, peace. I'm sure you can think of many others. That's the fun end to be on. And in fact, fun belongs up there with those. Fear is on the lower end of that spectrum. So one way we can displace or dissipate fear is to replace it with a feeling that has a higher emotional vibration. And in this case, that higher emotional vibration came from gratitude. Gratitude is just an easy one because it's so simple to do. Most of us can summon it within a moment's notice. It's actually a very effective way to move fear aside. Because like dark and light, fear and gratitude can't coexist in the same space. So I help you anchor yourself in time and space in the present moment with the input of your senses. I help anchor you in a calmer and more positive emotional vibration than fear. And third, I helped you anchor yourself to something greater than your fear, which is your life force. Your life force is an extension of and is always connected to the great source of life that brought you into being, that brought me into being, that brought each of us into being. When we worry about cancer recurrence, we're focusing on a possible diminishment of life. And as those thoughts preoccupy us, our lives seem to shrink. In fact, we even act accordingly sometimes. We put off or deny ourselves opportunities to live more exuberantly. Or if we engage in those opportunities, we diminish our enjoyment of them because our attention isn't fully in the moment of experiencing them. When we have a practice that regularly anchors our attention on the evidence of the vibrant life force flowing through us, that life force that's actually with us all the time, that makes our heartbeat and that breathes our breath for us, we know when we feel that life force flowing through us, that we're not alone. That we're part and parcel, we're just extensions of a larger universe that includes us, that's moving everything it can into life, into growth. So the more that we let that life force flow and expand through us, the more ways we find to do that, the less room fear has to expand within us. 
it simply can't gain a foothold if we feed and magnify and align with the exuberance of our life force. So how can we get good at this? How can we make this a regular practice so that it's available to us at a moment's notice? Well, anchoring your attention does take practice. And practicing of any new habit or technique or method is usually most successful when we have some sort of structure to guide that practice. If you are at your computer and are able to go to cancerfearfirstaid.com, cancerfearfirstaid.com, you'll be able to see the Cancer Survivor's Fear First Aid Kit, which is a simple five-step method that provides a guiding structure for you. What this kit provides is a reliable answer for when fear starts to worm its way in and take over your attention. This is a way for you to get right back in the driver's seat so fear can't hang around and eat away at your hope and sap your attention from days where you really need it. What I can guarantee you is that this method is very easy to learn. I've used it over and over with my survivor patients and it doesn't require any skill or experience that you don't already have. To make sure that this was true, I actually sent it out to the founders of some well-known cancer survivor communities, and I asked them to test it out. And you can see some of their comments here on this page. Again, we're at cancerfearfirstaid.com. Debbie Woodbury, who's a well-known blogger who writes about the emotional side of the cancer experience and often shares her fears with her community, tried this kit out and loved it. She said it was easy to learn and something that she could use now in those days and moments when she had her scans coming up and was feeling moments of fear. Chris Lewis, who's the founder of a, the most prominent online cancer support community in the UK, has said that fear of cancer is actually as dangerous as cancer itself. Chris tried this out and he said he'd never seen a resource like this before. And that the real joy of it was that it's so easy to learn and so easy to use. What this method consists of is a short paperback book that walks you through the five-step method. And then because each of us learns differently, I've included multimedia learning tools to help you get really good at it. If you learn visually, you'll find a laminated full-color quick access card that illustrates the five-step method in a beautiful infographic. And you can post it on your refrigerator or put it anywhere you're likely to see it often. And if you're the kind that's a kinesthetic learner who likes to move physically through a process in order to learn it well, I've included a workbook for you so you can write your way through the five steps and practice them that way. And even when you write your way through, after the few practices, you'll be completing the process in under five minutes, maybe even less than three. When you're good at this, Displacing fear becomes actually very simple. It isn't a hard and laborious process. For those of you who like an audio component to your learning, I've included a CD with audio tracks that step you through the method in guided meditations. This is actually a really powerful way to release fear from your body and your mind because by surrendering to the sound, you can actually notice your heart rate calming and your breathing become deeper and more relaxed. By the time you're through with the audio tracks, fear is a long way away. Because you've gotten back into the present moment, you're in charge, and you're creating intentionally joy and calm. So as you master this method, if fear threatens to set in, you'll know exactly what to do to move it aside and get on with creating a day that's full of plans to do what you love, to travel, to play with your grandchildren, whatever creates joy and fun for you. You'll be totally present with it. And fear will be a bystander standing far, far away. If you scroll to the bottom of the page that you're looking at, cancerfearfirstaid.com, you'll see two investment options for the system. For those of you who love the multimedia experience and love to hold things in your hands, you can click through right there to purchase the full deluxe kit for $45 at Amazon. 
And if you prefer a more affordable option, the book and workbook are available in downloadable PDF for just $25. So in summary, we can't make fear go away forever. It's one of our companions on life's journey. And if you think about it, everybody who's ever accomplished something courageous in this life has been accompanied by fear. But the difference is they didn't let the fear become their major focus. They found ways to focus on what they wanted most, what made them happy. Think of a mountain climber climbing Mount Everest. That's a dangerous path. It's full of fear. And there's never been anybody who's accomplished that without feeling fear. But what they did, they kept the summit of the mountain in mind. They kept in mind what made them happy, what was going to change their life. And by being able to focus on that, they were able to move through the fear and into the life that they really loved, the accomplishment that they really loved. And you can too. Every one of us has within us the ability to overcome those fears and create the life that we love living. It would be my joy and privilege to help you in any way I can to step into that power of yours and design a life after cancer that fully expresses the beauty of who you are. It's been a real delight to connect with you today. And I'm going to conclude this webinar with one more little meditation. This is one similar to one offered by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Just listen and then decide what you need to do to take action, to move yourself one step closer, your next step closer, to a life not controlled by fear, but a life characterized by love and joy. May you be truly happy. May you live in peace. May you live in recognition that your life has deep meaning and good purpose. May you live a life driven by love and not by fear. I'm Dr. Shani Fox. It's been my joy to be with you today. So long.